Hello, and welcome back to The Crime Reel. We are lucky enough to welcome a guest reader to our channel. This week's true crime story will be narrated by the excellent Mortis Media. If you enjoy his narration and would like to listen to his terrifying stories, a link to his channel is in the information below. If you can't wait until next week to hear some more from me, I shall be returning the favour and narrating some stories over on Mortis Media's channel. Let us know what you think in the comments below. Today, we will be visiting one of Chicago's most infamous cold cases, the double murder of Barbara and Patricia Grimes. Barbara and Patricia Grimes were two of the seven children born to Joseph and Loretta Grimes before their divorce in December 1951. This divorce had been amicable, and while the Grimes children lived with their mother, they still remained close to their father. Like so many teenagers in the 1950s, Barbara and Patricia were obsessed with Elvis Presley. The girls were described as being very close, well behaved, and were known to be attentive students at their respective high schools, Thomas Kelly and St. Maurice High School on the southwest side of Chicago. On December 28, 1956, three days before her 13th birthday, Patricia, along with her 15-year-old sister Barbara, decided to view a screening of Love Me Tender at their local theatre. Despite having already seen this Elvis Presley movie more than 10 times, they wanted to watch it again, leaving their home in McKinley Park at around 7.30pm and heading to Chicago's Brighton Theatre. Their mother guessed that the girls would want to watch the double feature and told them that they needed to be home by midnight. The theatre was approximately a mile and a half from the girls' home, and they left home to walk this short journey with approximately $2.50 in their possession. This was enough for their entry to the theatre, popcorn, and their bus fare home. A school friend of Patricia's, Dorothy Waynert, sat behind Patricia and Barbara at the movie theatre during the first showing of the film. Dorothy said that the sisters were in good spirits, and were waiting to buy popcorn for the second part of the double feature when she saw them last. Dorothy was the last known person to see the girls alive. With the sisters planning to stay for the double feature, they were expected home at around 11.45pm. When the girls had not arrived by midnight, their mother Loretta started to worry. She sent their older sister, Teresa, and brother Joey to wait for them at the nearby bus stop. Loretta, meanwhile, contacted the girls' friends in the hopes that they may have gone to one of their houses but with no luck. After three buses went by, with no sign of the girls, Teresa and Joey returned home, and Loretta reported the girls missing at 2.15am on December 29th. The girls' disappearance led to one of the largest citywide hunts in Chicago. During initial inquiries, several teenagers who had been at the Brighton Theatre on December 28th informed police that they had seen the two girls talking with, and then getting into a car, driven by a young man similar in appearance to Elvis Presley. The eyewitnesses consistently described the car as a Mercury model, but this lead soon became a dead end. Both police officers and civilians scoured the streets looking for any sign of the sisters. Hundreds of police officers were assigned to the case, and County Cook officers were assisted by colleagues from the surrounding suburbs. A task force dedicated to finding the sisters was formed. 
the police conducted door-to-door -door inquiries throughout the area. Rivers and canals were dragged. Flyers were distributed and rewards offered. Over 300,000 people were questioned, with over 2,000 of those being seriously interrogated. However, despite all of this effort, the search stalled and law enforcement were no closer to finding out what had happened to Barbara and Patricia. Extensive media appeals implored the girls to return home and requested any information from members of the public who may have been able to help. Numerous unverified sightings were reported to the police, saying that either one or both of the girls had been seen in a variety of different places. Sightings were reported in Nashville, Tennessee, which led to many believing the theory that Barbara and Patricia had run away in order to go to Nashville to see Elvis Presley in concert. On January 19th, 1957, Elvis Presley's Graceland estate issued an official statement to the girls. This televised statement read, if you are good Presley fans, you'll go home and ease your mother's worries. Elvis also made a direct radio plea to Barbara and Patricia, imploring them to return home. Loretta Grimes made a direct appeal in the event that the girls had been kidnapped and were being held. She begged that if someone was holding them, to please let the girls call her. Despite all of these appeals, police were still no closer to solving the crime. With no other leads, police could only surmise that the sisters had run away. Loretta continued to deny this possibility. She had insisted that they would never run away from home and also pointed out that they had taken no clothes and had no money. After an exhausting month of dead ends, the searches began to falter. However, it came to a heartbreaking end on January 22nd, 1957. A construction worker by the name of Leonard Prescott was driving along German Church Road on his way to the grocery store. A recent warmer spell had led to the rapid thaw of the heavy snowfall that had occurred in the area. As Leonard drove along this particularly rural country road, he saw what he believed to be two mannequins at the side of the road. However, uncertainty plagued him as he returned to the site with his wife Marie to confirm what he had seen. As they approached for a closer look, Marie fainted as they realized that the mannequins were sadly the nude frozen bodies of Barbara and Patricia Grimes. The Prescotts immediately reported their findings to the Willow Springs Police Department. It was believed that the girls' bodies had been tossed from a car and had probably been at the roadside since their heavy snowfall three weeks earlier. They were found next to the guardrail at the side of the road, just 10 feet away from the incline of the embankment on the Devil's Creek. Barbara lay on her left side and Patricia lay on her back, with her body covering her sister's head. Three wounds, consistent with those made by an ice pick, were discovered on Barbara's chest, and injuries resembling blunt force trauma were visible on her face and head. Bruises were also seen on Patricia's face and body. Both girls' bodies had also sustained injuries from animals, and had marks around their abdomens. Later that day, the girl's father, Joseph Grimes, was driven to the crime scene to formally identify his daughter's bodies. After a positive identification, over 160 police officers and numerous local volunteers conducted a search of the crime scene. This search did not uncover any evidence and was later criticized as organizers had allowed untrained individuals to trample over any evidence that may have been at the location. The following day, January 23rd, 1957, autopsies were completed on the girls. Despite unconfirmed sightings throughout January, 
it was determined that the girls had only lived for a maximum of four to five hours after they were at the theatre. The autopsies were performed by three expert forensic pathologists, who were unable to reach an agreement on either the date or the cause of death. Some felt the girls had died on the 28th, while others on the 29th. For both of the girls, the cause of death was ruled as being a combination of shock and exposure. The experts concluded that many of the wounds on the girls' bodies were likely from rodents, and the puncture wounds on Barbara's chest were most likely inflicted after her death. There were no obviously fatal wounds on either girl's bodies. The toxicology reports showed that the girls had not been drunk, drugged, nor poisoned. The official death certificate listed the cause of death for both girls as murder, the specific means of which in both cases were listed as secondary shock, resulting from exposure to low temperatures. The doctors on the case surmised that the killer was diabolically clever, who was skilled enough to use a method of murder that was undetectable. No items of either Barbara or Patricia's clothing have ever been found. Six days after they were found, on the 28th of January 1957, Barbara and Patricia Grimes were laid to rest at Holy Sepulchre Catholic Cemetery. The girls were in white closed caskets, each topped with their respective photography, and were buried near their sister, Leona Freck, who had died two years before them. Some of Patricia's school friends were pallbearers for their coffins. The case was highly publicised, and often treated incredibly disrespectfully by the press. Many theories were published with little or no evidence to back them up, and the press often made outrageous claims about the girls' behaviours. At the funeral, members of the press were very disruptive, with multiple reporters present paying little regard to those grieving for the young girls. Following the discovery of Barbara and Patricia's bodies, numerous suspects were apprehended. The most publicised of these was Edward Lee Bedwell. He was a 21-year-old drifter originally from Tennessee. It was reported that he was semi-literate and uneducated. He confessed to the murders, though there was never any evidence supporting his claim and he later recanted his testimony, claiming that the police had beat it out of him. His testimony was disproved due to inconsistencies in his versions of events, and both the injuries on the girls' bodies and their stomach contents. This together with the lack of evidence against him, meant that he was released without charge. Another suspect was 17-year-old Max Flea, Due to his age, he was protected by Illinois laws, which prevented juveniles from being subject to polygraph tests. Despite this, the Chicago police captain, Ralph Pettikew, persuaded the teenager to take an unofficial polygraph test, during which Flagg allegedly confessed to the murders. Due to the illegal nature of this test and lack of evidence, the police had to release Flagg without charge. He was later jailed for the unrelated murder of a different young woman. Barbara and Patricia's murders were later linked to another murderer, a 15-year-old girl by the name of Bonnie Lee Scott. Bonnie was killed about a year after the Grimes sisters, and she was discovered naked, with similar, non-lethal marks around her abdomen. The day after the body of Bonnie was discovered, Loretta Grimes received a phone call from someone, claiming responsibility for both Bonnie's murder and the murder of Barbara and Patricia. Loretta was adamant that this was the person responsible for her daughter's murders, as in the telephone call, they had mentioned a deformity on Barbara's foot, details of which had never been released to the press or public. Eventually, a man by the name of Charles Leroy Melquist was convicted of the murder of Bonnie Scott, but was never officially implicated in the Grimes murders. He was sentenced to 99 years in prison, but released 
after only serving 11. He later married and had two children. Could this have been the monster who killed the Grimes children, who was now living as a husband and father? Melquist died in 2010, having never been charged with another crime. Barbara and Patricia's mother later volunteered at a nearby prison and worked to ensure that police never stopped looking for her daughter's killers. Sadly, she passed away in 1989 at the age of 83, never knowing exactly what happened to her daughters or who had killed them. The murder of Barbara and Patricia is often seen as the murder that caused Chicago to lose its innocence. Finally, it officially remains a cold case today, 62 years later. A truly horrifying case, narrated superbly by Mortis Media. Thank you Mortis for doing that for me. Thank you everyone for listening to The Crime Reel. I hope you've enjoyed our narration of the case, and if you would like to hear more, please subscribe. Goodbye.